Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome at Crash Course Economics. I'm thrilled to see so many attendants today. Uh, my name is Sarah. Uh, I will be your host today. I am the coordinator of the Alternative Trade Coalition at the Transnational Institute, TNI. And my co-host of today is Rodrigo Fernandez, who is a researcher at SOMO. Behind the scenes are uh, Jeremy Krollsmith and Kees Hudig, who are working very hard to make this webinar a success today. So we are a collective of engaged activists and experts from a number of organizations, and you can find more information information on us on our website. So first I'd like to tell you a little bit about what Crash Course is. So Crash Course is meant as a platform and it's designed to open up the debate uh, on how we can move out of this crisis uh, and also take the necessary steps to achieve uh, social, economic and ecological justice, which is very hard needed these days. And we're inviting global experts to break down complex issues for you and make them accessible to all so we can really understand these issues and uh, democratize this knowledge. Um, and in that way, we can also work towards uh, an economic system for just recovery in future together. So uh, for you to know, there will be a recording of this session. Uh, it will be broadcast uh, live now and also put later on our website. There will also be a podcast and afterwards there'll be a short uh, summary and recap of our discussion. Um, during this series, we will discuss different topics. Uh, we'll also come to feminist economics, for example, and the Green Deal. But today's first series is on monetary policy. And I'd like to give uh, Rodrigo the floor to introduce our first topic. Uh, well, welcome. Um, so the first series is on monetary policies, uh, central banks and ideology. Uh, and this will consist of four seminars uh, in which we will invite every time uh, one expert uh, to discuss one of these elements uh, well, in this uh, world of monetary policy that has exploded since, the, since March 2020. Um, the first seminar will be uh, uh, is, is, is labeled uh, "Crisis: uh, Central Banks and Democratic Control: uh, The Building Blocks for Change." Um, so today we would like to address uh, well, really, the basic questions: uh, What are unconventional uh, monetary policies? Uh, they have existed since the global financial crisis, but how have they changed since uh, March this year? Um, uh, what are the origins of uh, central bank central bank independence, uh, and how can we organize this differently? Uh, and also, what the main ingredients would look like if you want to use uh, uh, monetary policies, monetary tools uh, for progressive uh, policies. So, um, so these are the issues we would like to discuss today. All right, thank you, Rodrigo. Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about the setup of this webinar. So uh, shortly, I will introduce today's speaker who will present his view on monetary policy in about 15 minutes. And thereafter, Rodrigo and I will ask him some specific questions also for about 15 minutes. And then it's up to you. So finally, we'll have a round of questions from your side that will be read out loud by me and Rodrigo. Um, in this session, it's not yet possible to participate in person, but we might change that uh, for the future seminars. So um, in the lower side of your screen, you have uh, different functions such as the chat function and the Q&A function. So please introduce yourself uh, in the chat if you like. You can tell who you are, where you're from and which topics you're specifically interested in. And then I'd like to ask you to put all your questions in the special Q&A tab or window that you'll find in the bottom of your screen. And we'll make a selection uh, based on those questions that are mostly favored. And if you really like a question, you can endorse it by putting the thumb up. There's a special button for that. Um, so we're looking forward to your questions later on. And for now, I'd like to introduce to you Jens van Klooster, who's our very first speaker uh, of today's series. Jens, we're very much delighted to have you here. Uh, Jens is a Research Foundation Flanders postdoc researcher at the KU Leuven, and he's also a member of the research group, a norm new normative framework for financial debt at the University of Amsterdam. And Jens research fits uh, in his own words, somewhere between normative political philosophy and political economy. We're looking very much forward to your view on monetary policy today, Jens, and please, you can kick off now. Yeah, yeah. Th thank you very much, uh, Sarah, Rodrigo and organizers for, uh, for giving me the opportunity to, to talk here. Um, let me just put up my slides. So I'm on an, an Apple computer, which is not my native environment, but I um, think this should work. So are you now seeing the slides? Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, 
No, and I'm somewhere in the middle of this fight. And it doesn't move. Why doesn't it move? This is not... Working. Don't worry, take your time. Okay. Find the right slide. Okay. And sharing. Yeah, this is a very specific challenge. Wait, let me go one. Give me one more try. So we're seeing you now. You're not yeah, screen sharing, just for your information. Yeah, exactly. We do see a nice painting behind you. So okay. <laughs> I think our attendees will not be bored. No, that's that's the most important, of course. Um, okay, let's see. Let me start this. Okay, okay, wait. So now I'm starting the slides and now it should be uh, working when I share screen, you will see yes slides. yeah, you're not seeing the slides? Yes, we are, yes, we are. okay. And then I should go full screen and you will see it. Yes, you should. Yeah. Are you now seeing exactly what I would want you to see? I think so. Um, yes. Where does the although money? Although we don't want a new update, I think. So <laughs> do, you, do you see the, the screen? Where does the money go? Yeah, but I also see a small pop-up new update available. So uh, if you mm. could click on your presentation, maybe yeah. it will disappear. Yes, uh, and then. Okay, how is this? This is a black screen for me, so this doesn't really work. Okay, this is, I'm very sorry for this. Um, again, presentation, black screen. It's another black screen, yeah, but um, we have Rodrigo in the neighborhood. Maybe he can help you. Or otherwise, Jens, uh, I mean, I do see your presentation now. Yeah. Um, so you can also work from this presentation if it's not possible to enter the full screen. How is this? This looks better. Yeah. Rodrigo, for you too? Yeah, it does. And otherwise, yeah, it, perhaps you could just give the presentation uh, without us seeing your PowerPoint presentation. Yeah. No, I don't even see. Ah, so uh, uh, Rob Geurts from panelists says it's perfect even. So I think uh, perfect. Okay. I think perfect is good let's, enough for us let's today. Let's get going. Okay. So so okay. So I thought I'd really give you a, a broad introduction to the the workings of of monetary policy. Right. This is really a super technical topic, and it's something a lot of people are like, oh, I I I, I I'm not really sure what it's all about. Um, and then there's a lot of people who have very strong, strong views. And, and I think this is really a part of the very problematic politics of monetary policy, namely that the discussions and deliberations are, are technical and really uh, limited to uh, a, a, a certain uh, po policy circles. Whereas, of course, the consequences of monetary policy are, are really pervasive. And it's really important that we discuss more about how as a society, we want to deal with money, right? Money is a key institution of a capitalist economy. So it really matters how you uh, do monetary policy. So I want to talk about what is monetary policy. Uh, then I'll move a bit to the, really the specific things that have happened in the past uh, decade. And then, and I think also certainly during the Q&A, we should talk about alternatives, right? And I think really the sort of key question, I think, to keep in mind in all of this is the question, where does money go, right? The state creates money, who gets that money? Okay, so what is monetary policy? What is money, right? So the very first question is just to ask, what is money? And there, I think the key thing to keep in mind is that we keep use the term money in two very different senses. So first, there's just the idea of money as a unit of account. So the euro and the dollar, and everywhere in a, a capitalist economy, uh, individuals and firm enter into contract with each other, sell stuff, go into debt, save wealth, and all of that happens in this specific unit of account, right? And this is just a very general institution 
of a capitalist society. But then there's also money in this very specific meaning, right? So just concrete, legal, even physical objects that serve as a mean of, means of payment for a specific currency. And here, I think the starting point for thinking about monetary policy is to see that there are two very different kinds of money in any existing capitalist economy. And this is a very striking feature, right? So on the one hand, you have public money forms issued by uh, central banks, cash, bank notes, coins, uh, and also central bank deposits, so money, uh, electronic money issued by central banks, but usually not accessible to the public, only available to the banking system. And then in addition to that, you have private credit money forms, right? So bank deposits, really uh, money forms that are created by the banking system, not by the state, but by private institutions. Okay, so why does that difference matter? Now, who issues money has really important consequences for how that money is circulated. When banks issue money, they do so guided by the profit motive, right? So banks issue credit money forms, bank deposits in the act of granting loans, with the hope that the money will be repaid and that they also make a profit on this as a consequence of interest rate payments, right? So when money is circulated by banks, the idea is that this goes into profitable ventures um, or at least is profitable to the bank. And then there are public money forms which central banks create as part of economic policy. And this is really, money creation that's entirely under public control. And that means that um, it can be used as part of economic policy. So also today, central banks create money not to make profit, but to achieve their uh, economic policy objectives. Now, why is this so different? So the key point to keep in mind is that a bank is a uh, private firm, right? It's like any other firm, it needs to make a profit to stay afloat. But central banks don't need to make a profit. And also, and this is very interesting, they can't really go bankrupt, right? So a central bank can go into debt, right? So it can say, well, I'll, I'll pay this kind of uh, debt in, uh, in its own currency. So for example, European Central Bank can say, look, I'm promising to pay millions of uh, euros, billions of euros in the future, and it will always be able to, to, to pay that debt, right? Because it can create the money in which it goes into debt. And that's really different from all other economic entities. And that gives it a potentially almost unlimited power in the context of, of capitalism. Okay, but then, what do, we, what do we do with this money, right? So this, there it becomes obviously immediately very political. And I think there it's fair to say that since the 1980s, we've really had a very, very limited conception of what central banks should be doing with public money, right? And this is the ideal of, of central bank independence, um, where the, overriding objective in, in all monetary policy is price stability. Um, you see uh, Milton Friedman already on the, on the picture telling us that if you put the federal government in charge of the Sahara Desert, within five years, there'd be a shortage of uh, sand. And I think um, Milton Friedman and uh, this general turn towards the market you see in the 1980s is really important to understand how central banks function today. So they, their mandates, their roles, their self-understanding are still shaped by the ideas that became prevalent in that time and that are profoundly skeptical of, of the state of public control of investment. So, so what on this conception is the role of monetary policy? It's very limited. So there's one overriding goal, namely price stability. And this means that the central bank tries to constrain public money creation, but also private money creation, aiming to prevent the economy from um, becoming, as they would say, overheated. In practice, that means 
uh, unemployment becoming too low, if unemployment becomes really low, prices go up, and the central banks try to prevent that by seeking to steer the uh, money supply. And then also in this very limited conception, they basically have one instrument to do this, which is the interest rate. So the central bank uses its control over public money with which it lends to the private banking sector to steer interest rates at which banks can borrow money. And that's a really important reference rate for banks. And there's a whole technical story there. But the idea is that if you provide banks with a really cheap ability to fund themselves, they will lend out a lot more. And if you really raise interest rates, then they will stop lending. And that will mean that they are uh, contracting credit, thereby um, giving less less uh, activity to the, to the economy. As a consequence, uh, unemployment will go uh, uh, up, right? So there's less activity, people become unemployed. And then over a period of two, three years, that will have impact, impact on the development of prices. And I think what's really key here is that all the ways in which monetary policy impacts the economy is transmitted via banks and the broader financial system. So I have a broad diagram here. So you start with, with the central bank, right? In this case, the European Central Bank, and then the central bank lends to the private banking system. And then the banking system really circulates that money into the economy. Uh, of course, before 2008, really a lot of that money went into uh, real estate and also a lot of money went from, from the broad core countries in the Eurozone more towards the periphery leading up to the um, Eurozone crisis, global financial crisis. Okay, so, so then a lot happens, of course, after 2008. And this is, I think, what we should be talking about more going forward. But I think the most iconic images we associate with that is really this exploding of central bank balance sheets. So you see here the, the Swiss National Bank, then the, the Federal Reserve, the uh, ECB, which just really explode their balance sheet. And that also means they're creating a lot of public money. So, so what's happening now? Central banks keep lending to the banking system, but they also start uh, lending directly via capital markets, either to, uh, to governments, right? To, uh, to Rutte, Angela Merkel, other Eurozone member states in the, in the case of the ECB. And also they start lending directly to, to firms. Now, when I say lending directly, they're not, um, writing out a debt directly to, to the state, right? That, um, but rather they are buying securities in financial markets, but they are securities issued by either states or by governments. And this is in a way something that's really, really new. And that we're also still, I think, as a society reflecting on, right? What do we think about this? Is this desirable? Um, and I think there is really where we should be asking a lot of questions. And I hope that also comes up in the coming weeks. Okay, so unconventional monetary policy, right? What does that mean? So that means purchasing securities from firms, from governments, and thereby trying to steer the broader behavior in financial markets. Um, and there you can distinguish a number of of key objectives, right? So key still in this story is, is price stability, right? So also here, the idea is that by raising interest rates, you can sort of contract economic activity, but really at the moment after the Eurozone crisis, after global financial crisis, central banks are trying to stimulate the economy, right? So they're trying to lower interest rates and thereby create inflation, but in addition to those price stability objectives, there's now also a choice. Who are you going to, to lend to, right? So whose securities are you uh, purchasing? And there you see that central banks are making choices, right? So they're making choices to support specific markets, right? Um, 
European Central Bank has made a deliberate choice to support covered bond markets, asset-backed security markets, um, and also um, uh, uh, corporate bond markets. But then there's also lending to government. And of course, if you are buying debt from governments, you're also supporting government finances. And then also interestingly enough, in some cases, for example, in the case of the Swiss National Bank, you see that this policy is also just motivated by, by profit in part, right? So at this point, uh, the profit motive does enter into uh, monetary policy. Okay, so, so now zooming in a bit more on the, on the politics of this, right? So if you look at, at the slides here, you see, you see that it's a, a specific set of companies that are eligible for, uh, for um, QE programs and also governments, right? So for example, the European Central Bank has until uh, two months ago, never bought Greek debt as part of its uh, QE program, right? So there are choices made who are included in the government debt pro program. And in the same way, there are choices made in who's included in the corporate security program. So how do central banks go about choosing who is included in these QE programs? So this is where the politics is, right? Where does the money go? Now, and that's, I think, really interesting. Central banks really try to avoid that politics in a way. And this is uh, a policy that is in central banking circles broadly known as market neutrality. So what central banks try to do is rather than actively shaping the prices for individual issuers, they try to replicate the market. They try to follow the market, try to stimulate the broader economy, but at the same time, they try to leave the relative prices of individual issuers broadly the way they are. And they do that in very different ways, right? So for example, if you look at uh, the Bank of Japan. The Bank of Japan has started buying shares. Ba Bank of Japan is currently one of the largest owners of Japanese uh, share shares, and they just buy this whole index. And you see that also in the case of the uh, Swiss National Bank. They really try to buy very broadly, right? Not target this on on specific issuers. Now, in the case of the European Central Bank. They really try to follow the specific market segments that they're focusing on, right? So if they're buying corporate bonds, they buy the whole uh, um, range of corporate bonds available in the market. And then also when they're buying government bonds, they're not making choices which government they're lending to, right? But rather they really strictly follow the capital key. So a, a, uh, the capital key is how much money the individual member states have paid in when the ECB was created. And that broadly follows population and the GDP of the different member states. So what central banks now do is they are creating money. They are no longer just lending that to the, the banking system. Rather, they're really directly buying securities from specific governments, from specific corporations, but at the same time aiming for market neutrality, thereby trying to avoid getting dragged into the politics of who they should be lending to and thereby avoiding questions of money becoming too political. But of course, money is always political. And then a topic that um, has been raised recently, and I think this really nicely illustrates that monetary policy is just by its nature political, is the fact that it has a very specific uh, environmental footprint, right? So because these programs are designed to um, uh, target bond issuers, particularly bond issuers with a high credit rating, it turns out that the companies that are currently eligible for the corporate bond buying program are just disproportionately fossil fuel companies. Um, you see here Shell, Ryanair, Daimler, uh, car companies, uh, luxury companies, right? A very specific set of companies that are, are eligible for, for these corporate bond buying programs. And actually you see this very broadly across monetary policy. So this is a very similar slide for the uh, uh, Bank of England corporate bond purchase programs. 
So let me zoom in a bit, right? What you see on the horizontal axis is the percentage that the uh, Bank of England is buying from these specific sectors. Then on the vertical uh, axis, you see uh, the relative size of these uh, companies in the economy. So what you see on this on this graph is that the uh, Bank of England uh, purchases are targeted on a number of sectors that are in part not really so important in the economy, right? Like electricity and gas, but, and that's what the color is representing, do have a very disproportionately bad environmental impact. Okay, now moving forward a bit. So how is central banking changing? Now with the COVID crisis, you see that central banks have really, really again, aggressively started creating new money. And this time also more or less overtly admitting that part of what they are doing is to prevent, uh, to, to support uh, government finances and also given up some of their previous uh, restraints in, in targeting these programs. Right? So the Bank of England has started uh, directly transferring money to the uh, uh, British state. Um, in the case of the ECB, they have announced this big pandemic emergency purchase program, 750 billion when it was announced, an extra 600 billion last week, enormous uh, sums of money. And the ECB, in the quote you see here, also says that it will revise previous self-imposed limitations if they hamper the action that the ECB is required to take in order to fulfill its mandate. So really strong uh, language, but at the same time, also continuing this, this practice of market neutrality, avoiding making money too political. And that's where you see the Greta Thunberg tweet, because again, the ECB continues purchasing corporate bonds with these undesirable environmental impacts. Okay, so now we're, we're approaching the end. Um, let me just very briefly say what now, and then I think we should, should open into the discussion. I think what's, what's really, really the key issue is that you have at the moment a huge tension between, on the one hand, the constitutional independent structure in which central banks are embedded, which provides them with very limited democratic input, but also with very limited legitimacy, right? Central bankers really feel we are not the sort of entity to make these sort of decisions and also feel very um, restrained to coordinate too much of their actions with governments, right? So to really ask governments, where should this money be going? And then they do things like lending to um, firms that probably wouldn't be ideal also from the perspective of these governments, also not ideal from a societal perspective. And I think really the challenge is to find new ways to make money more democratic, right? To get more public input, where do we mon want money to go? And to that end, rethink what money is currently doing in our society. Okay, I hope this gives you a broad input and I really look forward to talking more about these topics. Here I put up some recommended readings if you feel like, look, I really want to know more about this stuff. And uh, with that, I'll turn it over to uh, Sarah or Rodrigo. Thank you very much, <clears throat> Jens. Uh, yeah, I think uh, Rodrigo will be asking uh, his first question. Yes, uh, well, uh, Jens, uh, thank you for this uh, very interesting overview, starting with uh, money and ending with uh, yeah, the mess we're in right now. Uh, um, yeah, I, I would like to continue uh, on, on, on your last uh, slides. Uh, well, basically, uh, so we, we have seen this unconventional policies, monetary policy since the last financial crisis. Uh, we have seen how these balance sheets of central banks exploded, uh, how, uh, well, these trillions of euros and dollars were injected in the financial system. And they created all sorts of problems that were discussed in different ways. Uh, uh, wealth inequality uh, increased. Uh, it was mostly a stimuli for, uh, for, for brown companies, as you explained uh, very clearly, uh, as a result of this so-called market neutrality. Uh, there was a, um, 
a spillover. There were uh, there was uh, a, a, a lot of f money flowed to emerging economies, the global south, creating uh, well. Uh, rising debt levels there that we're seeing now coming back as a problem and of course it was a continuation of this debt-led economic model that led to the global financial crisis in the first place uh, and now it seems that since march 2020 uh, we see again uh, this very sharp increase uh, and, and, and of, of of the of the balance sheets of central banks and it seems to be more of the same or do you think that central banks have somehow learned or are able to change their ways uh, uh, in a way that would well, well would really tackle these issues of rising wealth inequality of brown being a brown stimuli not taking uh, seriously the problems it poses for uh, the global south do you see signs that central banks have learned from their previous mistakes or well do you yeah. see this yeah not there yeah, yeah, no, I think that's that's a really interesting question at the moment, right? So, what lessons have been learned from the previous crisis, and and what what should they be doing going forward with those lessons? Um, so, first, so I think you also really rightly mentioned a number of other side effects of monetary policy, right? So, uh, indeed, low interest rates really drive up. Uh, asset prices and that increases wealth inequality and also yes uh, monetary policy at these really big central banks like the, the Federal Reserve and the Euro really impact global financial markets and a lot of the uh, chaos and instability just gets exported to, to, to developing countries to emerging markets in ways that are incredibly unfair um, and maybe that is sort of a broader point to make in general that using monetary policy as a, as a means of stabilizing economies is just a very crude and um, crude tool with all sorts of side effects, right? And that, that's a key feature. And I think the, the environmental impact just again brings that out, right? If you just throw money into a market there will be all sorts of consequences that you haven't thought about. Okay, now, at the moment, there, this crisis, maybe something, something slightly different is happening, right? So first, this crisis is very different, right? It's not a banking crisis, it's a real economy crisis, right? So you've just put a large part of the economy out of work, right? Taken out the plug out, and then uh, firms go bankrupt. If you don't provide them with support, Households really get into trouble, right? 30, 40% of households in the EU are currently really struggling to, to make ends meet, right? So this is, this is, this is a, a, an insane policy challenge to, to address that I think nobody has really uh, a clear answer to. And I think then, then it's interesting to see central banks being quite supportive of governments in providing funding, right? So particularly the European Central Bank. So initially, Kassim Lagarde said, look, we're not here to close the spreads, right? We don't want to give too much support for governments. But now they're really moving to look, whatever you guys are doing, we're just gonna buy up bonds, we're gonna provide the uh, funding. And there, I mean, if you're super optimistic, you might even think that they've learned something from the previous crisis, right? So I think broadly, people think, okay, we have a lot of problems now. But if we add a, a sovereign debt crisis, then this whole thing is just going to implode. So I think that that's really a lesson that's been learned. And then I think that really there's also a risk that we think too much about the past, right? That we focus on lessons we've learned. If, if, if I may ask a, 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 a short uh, follow-up question. Um, so well, it, it, perhaps it's always a problem that it is in a crisis situation that central banks uh, start these have started these policies. So it, it, there's always a necessity. You could say that in the, gl the global financial crisis, there also was a need to act uh, and in the, in the period thereafter. Uh, and, uh, but uh, if we look now at like what the Federal Reserve is doing, uh, uh, mandating uh, uh, private funds basically to buy assets uh, and, and buy uh, uh, also a much, a much wider set of of, of assets, uh, of basically uh, inflating the stock market directly, um, I would say um, 
well, this is this has a very clear and direct consequences for uh, wealth inequality. So uh, mm -hmm. I don't see any lessons learned there. Yeah, well, so so the issue is, and this has happened previously, and that's happening again, right? So if you're in a crisis, your ability to really target policies is, is quite limited, right? And there's also a strong dependence on the private sector to, to fight that crisis, right? So in the previous, in the banking crisis, I think looking back, it probably wouldn't have been an idea to not save the banks, right? You would have just hit normal people even more than, mm. than what happened, right? I think what, what went really wrong that there wasn't more support for, for households, right? That there was this very selective support for, uh, for banks. And then certainly in the, the years after the crisis that, that normal people paid, paid the bill, so to say, right? So has a lesson been learned from that? And what would that lesson be? Well, I think there the lesson would just be, be less dependent on, on the private sector, right? If you make your whole financial system entirely private, then in the case of a, a banking crisis, you are just bound by, by that system and you need to prop up that system. That is your crisis fighting, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that's also very clear now in the case of the US. You know, what's the US doing? They are asking their central bank to lend money to, to companies, right? This is not an ideal con construction. I think that that's at the moment probably working better in, 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 in Europe, right? Where you still have uh, finance ministries who feel they can do this, right? That they don't need their, their central bank to do that. Um, and there, I think there's just a much deeper issue of resilience. I think that's what the Corona crisis again brings out right that just if you are so structurally dependent on uh, private money creation a private financial system then you need to work via that system to fight the crisis right and throw money in there and mm. I, I think you are right that that's in part happening again Jens, thank you so much. I also have a question for you. So uh, you've sketched um, a certain display of the central bank uh, being on the one hand eh, market neutral uh, because eh, that's, that's of course its mandate, right? Uh, it has to be uh, neutral, price stability, etc. On the other hand, we're seeing unconventional monetary uh, policies where you see very targeted QE eh, when it comes to supporting specific countries or specific firms. And then what you said struck me quite much that money is always political, right? And uh, that you think that money should be more democratized. Uh, so what's your um, view on how to achieve these goals? Um, is it a question of changing the mandate? Do we need more radical steps? So what are the ways to uh, democratize money and also democratize the policy of central banks, which are quite independent now, right? Very much uh, yeah. Yeah. to the loof of uh, politics. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, I think that's the big one, the, what I think is the big one of the big questions at the moment, right? And there, um, so first, market neutrality itself isn't really in the mandate, right? And also, if you look at the ECB mandate, there's all sorts of stuff there they could draw on to explain what they're doing if they would choose to look very seriously at sustainable uh, social objectives, right? So there's a secondary mandate that just says, support the uh, objectives of the EU and EU governments. Um, there's also uh, just an immense amount of room for, for choosing different instruments, right, that, that have certain impact. And then, yeah, the, the, the picture I've tried to sketch is that on the one hand, there is like, we're neutral, but of course, neutral does have all sorts of impact, right? It's not um, uh, innocuous, right? It matters matters how you are neutral and maybe you shouldn't be neutral, right? Uh, now, so then if that's the diagnosis, so it's not really the mandate, it's really the institution making that choice, then I think that also suggests the direction you need to go, right? You can't just change the mandate a little bit and then expect things to, to change. I think you really need more societal input into monetary policy making. There are different ways in which that could go, right? So in the case of the European Central Bank, you could think about uh, the member states giving more input. You could also think about the European Parliament having a more prominent role. And um, you could also uh, 
imagine a more regular process of providing input into the uh, into the mandate. Right, and is there an example of a central bank which is doing a great job in this respect in the world, you think? Or is it going to be the ECB after this crisis? Yeah, like a central bank that's currently really very responsive to societal views on where money should be going. I don't think there are many who are, for example, taking this climate issue very seriously um, when it comes to monetary policy, right? If it comes to banking regulation, yes comes to monetary policy, central banks are currently just very hesitant to uh, to take the climate objectives into the core of their, their monetary policy mandate. And I think that's also um, how central banking has evolved, right? It's really a community of central bankers which shares a broad uh, set of views, normative ideas, right? An epistemic uh, community. And that's now, now shifting, right? So there are these green topics are are slowly entering the agenda but I, I i wouldn't be surprised that if one bank moves then a lot of them suddenly move right and that it's also not surprising that nobody's moving at the moment in that regard right so we're seeing uh, a lot of questions uh, in the q a uh, section i will Great. read one out loud now which is um posed by shanti margareta uh, given the fact that monetary policy is transmitted through the banking and financial system qa qe may give rise to inflation of asset price uh, which are mostly owned by the already affluent people and it could exacerbate the existing income and wealth inequality, which you uh, also discussed in your presentation. So if a financial system of a country is not functioning well or is impaired, making the appropriate impact of QE to the real economy is not materialized, is there any other way that a central bank can uh, address the issue of widening income and wealth inequality, especially in times like these? And thank you very much for this interesting question, Shanti. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so this um, is was also raised by Rodrigo. So let me go into this specific issue because I think there we have to look at it a bit differently um, than, than we now tend to do, right? So our current view tends to be, okay, ECB, central banks, they do QE, right? That uh, drives up asset prices because they're buying uh, uh, bonds and then because bonds are, are more expensive than other assets also become, financial assets become more expensive, expensive because investors are reallocating their portfolio, right? So some investors who thought, okay, I'm gonna go buy bonds, they're now buying uh, equity and uh, because interest rates going down, also houses are, are, are bought more, right? Now, the first step in that, and large part of that is buying government bonds, right? And um, why do interest rates go down? Because the central bank is buying government bonds, but governments aren't spending, right? So there's a really important counterfactual there. What if the central bank buys the bonds and the governments are spending, right? This is, this is entirely possible, right? This would be sort of broadly equivalent in effect, maybe also more effective for achieving price stability, stimulating the economy, right? So everywhere where a central bank is doing QE and governments aren't spending, that, that drives down interest rates, makes assets more expensive, drives up inequality. But there's also always a government that's, that's sleeping, right? So there, there's already a really clear democratic path to, to solving that, namely spending more money. Now, of course, now we're in the middle of a crisis where governments are really forced to, to spend more more money. So maybe that's also a bit a debate from the past two years, where just past years where too little has happened, right? So a really long recovery. But I think that's really important to keep in mind that wherever QE government bond purchasing drives up asset prices, there are governments not spending enough. So I would like to uh, continue with two questions. Uh, I, I, I'm going to try to take them together. Um, so one by uh, uh, Rob Geertsen. Uh, the money the ECB spends is a debt uh, by the people living in the Euro countries. So how is this democratically uncontrolled decision-making institution making decisions on our behalf? The same goes for all central banks. The people pay 
uh, but are not allow democratic influence. This messes uh, with my logical thinking. Uh, th this is one question and, and, and a question that is slightly related to that, uh, or, or uh, it could, uh, is a question by uh, uh, Dow Kuipers. Uh, how do the directors of central banks get appointed? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's clear, right? So there's now a lot of decision-making power at the central bank. Uh, it's there, of course, in part because governments are not doing anything, right? So central banks will just say, well, look, we have a mandate. Nobody changed our mandate. We're, we're doing the best we can with the, the current means. But yeah, obviously, now you have a situation in which there is a lot of power there, which is not democratically accountable. And then uh, to the question of how do central bankers get appointed? So they get appointed by governments, right? So in the uh, ECB case last year, we had this whole, whole game going around, like who's going to be the new head of the commission? Who's going to be the new head of the central bank? And this is a, a, a set of political decisions where people move forward views that, that, that fit their broad ideological perspective. Um, but once you're in, in that position, right? So once you're appointed, you're independent and you can decide what you think is best. Right. Um, so there's an interesting question uh, when it comes to democratizing uh, money and uh, making these issues more democratic, uh, which is the following. Um, how should we as citizens address uh, the problem? Central bank independence is part of the EU uh, constitution. Uh, changing this will be a big task. And are there any intermediate steps uh, that we can demand uh, from our government to take? The question is posed by uh, Richard Lang, and I think it's quite uh, exciting because it's, it's appealing to us all, I think. What can we as citizens do? Yeah, yeah, well, I think, so, so moving from ambitious to less ambitious, right? So first, you can change the ECB mandate, right? Everybody is like, no, you can never change the EU treaties. Uh, it's true, it's been difficult, but I think if there would be like a targeted decision to look just at the ECB and just say, well, do we want this? Do we not want this? I think that would be very desirable, also very feasible. That's just my personal view. But assuming that you don't change the treaty, yes, there's a lot of room in the treaty also for more democratic input, right? So as I already mentioned, the ECB has a primary mandate, price stability. The secondary mandate is support the economic policies of the EU and economic policies in the European Union. The EU can spell out what those objectives are, right? They can just say, look, these are our objectives. These are the things that we want the ECB to take into account. And that, that's, that's not happened in the past. That's just, again, government sleeping at the wheel. And then I think, thirdly, European Parliament could do so much more, right? So now they have the, the dialogue where they ask five minute questions to the, uh, to the uh, uh, president of the ECB, Mario Draghi, currently Christine Lagarde. That's very short. I think often answers are unsatisfactory. And there's also not really any sanctioning mechanism, right? So accountability normally has these two aspects on the one hand asking for an explanation on the other hand some way of responding if you think that policies have not not been good right if there are bad decisions that second part is currently missing and i think it would already be really good to have some kind of formal procedure where the european parliament says this is really bad if you look at the carbon intensive purchases ep members have been saying this for years right stop doing this new crisis still doing it Greta Thunberg, absolutely right that this is ridiculous and they should stop doing it. Uh, so we still have some 11, 10 minutes. So I, I, I'll continue with more questions. Uh, and and, and I, I just follow uh, uh, the questions that have most thumb ups. So um, I, I, I yeah, try to be democratic. Uh, market neutral in this. Uh, um, so one question. Uh, is, is from uh, a colleague for me, uh, actually, from uh, also from the University of Leuven. Um, no, I, I didn't put a, give him a thumb. Uh, um, so I, I just read it out as a question. Uh, one has to remember that QE does increase uh, inflation, inequity, bond, uh, real estate markets. Inflation is just uh, a much more complex phenomenon than just the prices of everything. 
uh, in the economy uh, rising at the same rate. See uh, Minsky, Minsky's uh, paradox uh, of public intervention. So, but I don't know. Is, if the is, is that was the question? There. Yeah, but I, no, I think I think that that's that's right. Um, so now, okay, this may be good good to to look into a bit more detail. Right? So, okay, central banks, price stability, inflation. But then, what central banks look at is consumer prices, right? So, what do consumers, so households, what do they really spend on stuff, and how are those prices going up? Uh, asset prices are not in there, right? So, if housing prices by themselves go up. That, that doesn't factor into inflation unless and to the extent that it uh, affects the cost of living on a year-to-year -year basis, right? So there's a real choice in what you include and what you do not include in an, um, in an inflation index. Now, do you need to politicize that, right? So for one, it's maybe not a good idea to include real estate prices into the inflation index for from a progressive perspective, and here is why. Housing prices are currently really going up. So at that point, inflation estimates would be higher. That would mean that central banks feel that they need to accommodate the economy less, right? So from a bank perspective, the central bank's perspective, the economy is doing better when prices go up, right? So if you include real estate prices in the inflation target, then the central bank will feel less need to support the economy lend to governments. I think that's from a progressive perspective, broadly undesirable. Um, but I think the deeper issue that this illustrates is that inflation is not such an obvious focus of public policy, right? So we come from this period in the eighties where it was like really high inflation. We need the central bank and it just does one thing, focus on inflation, but Maybe it's not so obvious that that should be the, the only target of a central bank. Certainly not obvious that it should be the only target or care of economic policy, right? Economic policy should be thinking about climate impact, should be thinking about social impact. And then once you really start digging into inflation, right? I don't think the right thought is to, to shift around with that inflation definition but just to include a much broader range of, of considerations and why, why you're doing economic policy, right? So um, if you now look at where, where central banks should be going, sure, right? Some really high inflation like you had in the 1970s, obviously not desirable, but probably you really want to broaden your thinking, not by including real estate prices, by, uh, but by including all these other factors that you should be thinking about in doing economic policy. So very short follow-up question on this. I know we, we don't have much time, but just uh, for me to understand. Um, so, yeah, I agree. We should not have this one-dimensional focus on, on inflation. Uh, it's not, uh, it's, it's, it, it cannot incorporate all the needs, social needs, uh, ecological needs. But if we exclude these elements from our measurement of inflation, uh, share prices, well, leading to wealth inequality, uh, real estate prices, leading to unaffordable cities uh, uh, and also all sorts of social problems. Aren't we then simply closing our eyes to mm -hmm. uh, many of the negative consequences? And on the media, yeah. on the short run, because of course in the long run, we would like to have a, 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 another focus. But in the short run, since we don't have this other focus, would excluding those types of inflation, yeah, not simply be closing our eyes? Yeah. Um, no, so I mean, I, I, it's clear that there's something going really wrong with um, um, particularly urban housing markets, right? Where, you know, like people, our generation, you know, try to get a house if you don't have rich parents, right? Good luck. Um, I just think that thinking about that in terms of inflation is the wrong way to go, right? I think you should just think about that in terms of maybe inequality. Uh, also think about that in terms of housing markets functioning very badly, but but I just wanted to say, if you think about that as inflation, the consequences of that are, are broadly conservative, right? Currently, it's in, within the ECB, it's really the more conservative central bankers arguing for including housing prices in the inflation index. All right, thank you so much, Jens. Um, so we've been discussing the consequences of monetary policy for inequality, mainly between 
people and within uh, within countries or within the European Union. But there's also, of course, the question of uh, the North versus the Global South, right? So uh, this question comes from uh, Grace Kelly. Grace, nice to have you with us. Uh, Grace writes, while I agree with Jens on a normative level, how nice it is that we are discussing this in the rich democratic global North, where we could feasibly have a reasonable democratic relationship between our central banks and governments. You mentioned already a few examples thereof. While lower middle income countries are trying QE2, um, but it can become incredibly dangerous given low levels of democratic accountability. So the question is inequality uh, would soar if richer countries had political control over monetary policy or wouldn't it? Uh, what is your view on this? So the relationship between QE in the North yeah. um, and the effects thereof on, on the global South and how um, perhaps the specific mandate or, or the policies used by uh, the central banks could also avoid that the inequality would widen between the North and the global South. If yeah. I understand you correctly, Grace Kelly. Yeah. No, I think this is a very serious concern. And thank, thanks a lot for, for bringing that up. We also mentioned it. Uh, so in emerging market developing countries are in a situation of incredible dependence on a global dollar system, which also now in the current crisis just places them in an immense position of uh, vulnerability and also um, makes them very uh, affected by monetary policy choices made in, in core capitalist countries, right? So the process we just described, right, where you uh, lower the interest rates on bond, right, but really buy a lot of bonds and then investors start reallocating into uh, stocks and into housing, also drives investors into uh, emerging market developing countries. And then there you get uh, money inflows and then in a crisis it flows out again and just an incredibly destructive dynamic for which central banks currently also are, are taking very little responsibility, right? So they really say, well, look, we have this domestic price stability mandate. Um, we should not be looking into uh, the effects on, on other countries, right? And even the idea that central bank in part also achieved their objectives by affecting the exchange rate, right? They, they, they're very hesitant to admit that. But of course, monetary policy also works via the exchange rate, right? So you just add a lot of money in the economy, your, your currency becomes cheaper and you get more import, right? This is just an uncontroversial fact. This is in part how monetary policy works. We haven't gone into that yet. Um, and then, yeah, the question of democratization is interesting there, right? So you wonder, is this democratic? Why are these institutions allowed to make decisions that have so much impact on uh, citizens, individuals outside their borders, right? Shouldn't you think more about a, a global financial system in which those views are also represented? And I think that's, that's entirely uh, possible, right? I think also, in theory, the Bretton Woods institutions could have a really important role in there, right? World Bank, the IMF, currently not having that role. But uh, that also in part just represents the specific governance structures of these institutions. Now, don't want to go too far out there, but I very strongly support the sentiment and uh, views raised in that question. Right, so I think it's time for the very uh, last question. Uh, Rinse uh, Yeluma is posing a lot of questions, but we've uh, favored one, which is uh, the following. Um, I'd like to go away from the old fashioned insight of monetary policy, uh, writes Rinse, uh, where so called experts are taking the shot at tax money. Corona has opened the door a little to tax for the benefits of civilians. I like it to give me a future view, a look into what might be possible on democratic ECB structures, and please make it positive, Jens. Wow, what a great question to end on. Um, okay, so, so let me just give you a very optimistic view, right? The European Commission is now starting a big budget, right? It's too small, it could be a lot bigger. And the European Commission wants to fund that by buying, by giving out bonds, right? So the European Commission is going into the market, trying to get money from the market, right? Issuing bonds, and then it wants to spend a lot of that money on, on the recovery, also on the green agenda, 
right? Imagine money like that going into train systems for the whole EU, but really getting an infrastructure that, that's sufficiently green and maybe also doing something for the rest of the world, right? Doesn't need to all go to, to, the, to the EU, right? So this is, this is things you could imagine. And then also you can see the ECB can just buy those bonds, right? There's nothing in their mandate that stops the ECB from buying bonds issued by the commission. Of course, commission is not an independent agency, right? It cannot do anything without support of the member states. Now, particularly the Dutch have been blocking everything the past weeks, right? And if you're a Dutch progressive, this should be very high on your agenda, right? This is really where the Netherlands are stopping green transition, where they're stopping uh, a really effective response to the crisis in, in other member states that have been struck very, very hard that don't have the same fiscal capacity to adapt these uh, to these changes. Okay, now I'm going off target. Anyway, what is still entirely possible is for the commission to just borrow a lot of money for the ECB to, to buy all the securities that they issue and then on the EU level, just really move forward green agenda, a social agenda. Uh, and this is, I think, what we should be fighting for. All right, nice. thank you. I think uh, I think that's a nice uh, note to end on before we have more uh, more critical questions and more pessimist uh, answers. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, Jens, thank you again very much uh, for your uh, wonderful presentation and also um, all your great answers. Um, I'm really sorry for all the questions that couldn't be answered. Um, maybe next time we can discuss them uh, into depth uh, because we'll have another uh, webinar which will be on the 19th of June at four o'clock Central European time and it will be starring Benjamin Brown. Ah, Benjamin Brown is a senior researcher. Yeah, Jens knows him. He's a senior researcher at the Max Planck Institute uh, for the Study of Societies in Cologne. He's also a member of the School of uh, Social Science at the Institute uh, for Advanced Study in uh, Princeton. And he will also be discussing central banks, but more um, from the perspective of power structures that central banks are uh, embedded in. Um, so you'll find a recording uh, of this session on our website. Um, I will show you our website in a second. Uh, there we go. So this is our wonderful website built by uh, Jeremy. Um, in the below, you will find here our second session. So if you click on sign up now, you can sign up for our second session. And we will put uh, a recording of our first session uh, here on uh, the main page. And there will also be a short uh, written summary thereof. So uh, I hope to see you all um, for the next session, uh, please invite all your or your friends. Uh, invite your mother. Actually, um, these uh, webinars we forgot to tell you are uh, aimed at your mother. So we want to be able to explain to your mother how these complex issues uh, function. And I think uh, we've succeeded uh, very much. Actually, uh, I know that some mothers of uh, our speakers and uh, panelists were attending. So I'm looking forward oh, to hearing their view. Hi, mom. No, hi, mom. Uh, so uh, this is it for now for today. Thank you again for being here. Um, and I'd like to see you uh, on our next session on the 19th. Goodbye uh, to you Thank you, you Sarah. Yeah, thanks. And thank Goodbye. you, Rodrigo. Thank you, Jens. Bye. Questions.